guys and welcome to today's video. So I'm currently training for a sub 1 hour 20 half marathon and I'm going to be showing you through this video exactly what I'm eating over the course of the day. However, it is a little bit of inception because today is actually the day before I'm showing you what I'm eating. The reason being is because I was asked exactly what my recipe is for overnight oats. So I'm going to be showing you exactly how I do that now. I was a little bit obnoxious in the last video, I think. I'm not going to show you how to prepare it because if you don't know how to make oats, then you should probably not be watching this video. But I have these lovely glass tubblewares that I've got here. So typically, the day before I'm going on a long run, which you will be in the video, I'm running 24 kilometers tomorrow. So that is my longest run of the week, training for this sub one hour, 20 half marathon. So typically what I do is, the day before I do these long runs and the day of the long runs, I'll increase my energy sources. So I'll increase my carbohydrates and fats. So the more explosive the exercise, like sprinting, for example, or powerlifting, you're gonna be burning predominantly carbohydrates. However, on the other side of that, the more slower the movement is, like walking for example, you're going to be burning predominantly fats. It will never just solely burn one energy source at a time. It isn't possible for our bodies to just burn carbohydrates or just burn fats. It will always be burning both, but the percentages will change based off the exercise and the explosive intensity of the movement or the exercise that you're doing. The day before I do my long run, so I've got a 24 kilometer run tomorrow, I eat more carbohydrates and more fats, my two energy sources, and the day of my long run as well. So obviously I'm gonna be showing you a full day of eating tomorrow. However, I wanted to show you a little bit as to why I have more carbohydrates and more fats over the course of the day before. So I have 120 grams of oats, where I'd have kind of like 80 grams if it was a normal day, potentially 100 grams. The reason why I up my carbohydrates percentage by around 25 to 20% on the days of my intense training and the day before is because I want to get my glycogen stores up, my glycogen levels, that basically means the amount of carbohydrates that your body's holding on to in that specific moment in time. So if your glycogen stores are up, you're going to have more energy for the coming days. So that's why I have more carbohydrates the day before my long runs. I'm going to put my tubbleware on here and then I'll zero that and I'll just put 120 grams of oats in here. So an increase of around 20%. Essentially what overnight oats is, is just like you would do porridge or normal oats where you'd cook it on a hob or the microwave. You're essentially just skipping out the cooking process. And the oats would just soak up the water or milk, whatever you prefer to use. I prefer to use milk personally. So as well as that, I'll supplement that with some sodium or salt. The reason why I have sodium is because you lose so much sweat, which carries salt in your long run. So like endurance sports, for example, you lose so much of it. And salt is so important for keeping us hydrated because salt basically holds on to bodily fluids. So like if anyone's an MMA fan, for example, or boxing fan, when people are trying to cut weight, they cut out sodium of the diet so that that water weight can basically come off them easier than it would. If they had salt, then the body's gonna hold on to that moisture. However, obviously for endurance sports, it's incredibly important because for one, you're not going to get cramps as easy because basically cramps come when you're either dehydrated, fatigued or a lack of sodium. So if we can control having the sodium then it's going to basically help us be more hydrated than we would be if we didn't have it. And obviously if you're getting cramps from fatigue then that's just part of endurance sports. So I have sodium with my oats purposely so I'm not getting cramps and so my body can hold on to my fluids so I'm not getting dehydrated on my long runs and ultimately affecting my performance. So with that I'll just have a scoop of protein in there as well. So one scoop in like that. And then once all my powders are in, I'll just mix those together. So I do sometimes have cinnamon in here, to be honest, most of the time, but I've ran out of cinnamon, unfortunately. It's absolutely horrific news because it is my go-to. So I just mix all those together. And I was asked recently on a video if I always track my calories and macros. And the answer to that, to be honest, is no. I don't really track them at all but I have a general idea of what I should be eating through experience and years of tracking my calories and macros. So I tend to have a rough idea of what macros I need. So if I haven't had enough carbohydrates, I kind of know fats, proteins, whatever it is, I'll always eat a lot of vegetables as you'll see throughout the day. I'll just put the milk by the way in with the oats. I'm using here sweet and soy milk. They didn't have any unsweetened almond milk in the shop. It's absolutely horrendous because I would normally use unsweetened almond milk. I try to stay away from extra sugars if I can help it. The only sugars I tend to have is fruit but anyway a little story earlier this year in lockdown so 
I was meeting my mates in Hyde Park, I believe it was, or Regent's Park. It doesn't really matter, but yeah. So I was meeting them for a picnic, and I went there, and I was cycling there, and I weighed out some crisps in a little pot when I was going to the picnic. And uh, when I got there, I didn't really think like it was a bit weird or anything. I just kind of did it because I was tracking my calories and macros. And my mate goes to me, how come you've got uh, your crisps in a little pot? And because I was cycling, I just came up with a quick, quick excuse like, oh, it's just I didn't want a crisp packet to explode in my bag when I was cycling. He's like, oh, fair enough. But in my head, I was like, fucking hell, I'm going insane. I literally tracked in a little fucking pot those like kettle chips. I put those in just so I could track my calories and macros. And then it was like that point I realised that I was like, nah, this isn't right for me. Like, because I've got a little bit of an obsessive personality, I think. That's probably a little bit egotistical to say, but I think I probably do have somewhat of an obsessive personality. And for me, tracking calories and macros, it just starts to form an unhealthy relationship with food. So a lot of people that have body dysmorphia or anorexia, it's just basically an eating disorder. And I'm nowhere near that at all, but I felt like it was unhealthy and it was going towards that way. So that's the reason why I don't track my calories and macros, but I will put them in this video for the purpose of the video so you can see roughly how much I'm eating. But I do tend to weigh my food out just so I know volume. It's like, for example, I'll weigh my own oats here just because I can't see by eye how much it is. So like it just, like I, I know I'm weighing it, but I'm not tracking my calories and macros, if that makes sense. So with these overnight oats here, you can either put your fruit on. If I'm working, for example, if I have to go into work, I'll put my fruit on now. It's the weekend now, so I don't need to worry about putting my fruit on now. Like if you put on bananas and then put it in the fridge, the bananas go a little bit brown, I found. So I'll tend to put my fruit on fresh just so it's a more enjoyable process of eating it. I tend to eat foods that I enjoy eating because this is a lifestyle. I cringe out a little bit when people say oh, this is a diet you need to follow. Like for me, diet insinuates that it's a little bit of a temporary fix. I don't see the point of introducing eating habits or diets if you're not going to stick to it. So I tend to put some effort into my cooking or foods that I personally like just so I know I'm going to stick to it a lot. I've eaten like this for a while now and for me it's like I enjoy eating like this still so I don't like crave bad foods as much. I do tend to have one cheat meal a week on a Sunday which is the last run of the week so it's a kind of reward for me. But throughout the week I won't eat any bad foods and it makes me feel better. I'm healthy for it. My performance is better in my running, for example. So it's just a win-win for me personally. So once you're happy with the oats, you can just put those into the fridge and the oats will soak up the milk I've put in there. So it'll get thicker. As you can see, that's a little bit loose here. So tomorrow those oats would have soaked up the milk. So it essentially is mimicking a cooking process. It's really easy to do. It's nice and quick. And to be honest, I've been eating this for ages and it is still probably my favorite meal of the day. I do also do a little bit of intermittent fasting. So I tend to follow a 16 night window. Eight hours is what my eating window is and the 16 hours is when I'm not eating at all. So in that 16 hours, there's a little bit of confusion. People think you can have like cups of tea and stuff. You can if it's like green tea or black coffee because it doesn't have any calories in it or like one or two calories. But if you start putting milk or honey in, then you're not going to be in a fasting state. The reason why it's healthy to be in a fasting state, essentially your body will switch to being in a state of ketosis, which is basically meaning a fat burning state. The reason why this is good, once your body's in a fat burning state, because it's burning carbohydrates if you eat them throughout the day. If you stop burning carbohydrates, your body will then, once it's used the carbohydrates, it will tend to burn more fats. When it's in a state of ketosis, it means your body has time to repair cells, which ultimately helps with digestion. It helps with inflammatory diseases like heart disease, for example. And all those ketones and cells in your body, your body will have chance to repair them. Your body is a little science project. So if it realizes it's not digesting food, then it can put that attention into repairing cells. So that's the reason why I do it. But the reason why I do this as a runner is over your long runs, like for your marathon, for example, even if you have a load of carbohydrates in your body, there'll be what the wall is essentially for a lot of people. It's kind of a thing in your head where you're quitting. And the reason why people quit on the wall, it's a transition from your body switching from predominantly carbohydrates to predominantly fats. So when it goes over that line, it's kind of you go for a few minutes of feeling flat until your body goes into burning predominantly fats. So 
those few minutes you have is when people quit and that's kind of one of these things where people call that the wall so the reason why i intermittent fast is i like my body to get used to burning fats so if this ever happens to me when i run it's kind of like my body will know exactly what to do so if i'm out of carbohydrates it will kind of just start burning fats as well so that's the reason why i intermittent fast and not only that it's convenient for me as well like if i'm working if i'm editing a video over the whole morning i can just focus on editing the video and i'll get in flow state easier where if I'm stop starting to have food I find my work isn't as enjoyable so like when I'm editing a video I like to kind of have no distractions get into flow state for example so that's the reason why I do it I also do it in the week at work as well it just makes me feel better in all honesty so anyway enough talking tomorrow I'm going to be showing you a full day of eating and I'll see you guys on my 24 kilometer run <laughs>
like you've already seen, I've got a shitload of fruit and vegetables in here. So this is just a good way for me, as I explained on a previous video, just to get a sheer amount of vegetables and fruit that I wouldn't be able to get if I ate them whole. So I like to blend the spinach and kale first, and once they're blended in with the milk, I do those with some like banana as well. Then I'll tend to put the other things in bit by bit, as you saw. Cherries in, I put in the end as well. And do not put your peanut butter in at the start, because otherwise it'll just stick and you won't be able to get it off. So a few little tips there. whole sweet potatoes and then asparagus as well with my salmon that I did with some ginger, lime, chilli, salt, pepper. As always, sweet potato have been seasoned with a bit of garlic, salt and pepper as well. just been chilling for a little bit and now it's workout time so I'm gonna have to get myself up from the chair and do a little bit of working out so basically I wanted to show you my little setup I've got here I don't know if you can see that I've basically got my Spotify linked up to my TV on my PS4 so I'm gonna blast tunes through that I'm also gonna put music over the top so I don't want to get done for copyrighted one of the worst things at YouTube but anyway so today's workout I'm gonna be doing a little bit of push I think so I'm gonna be doing like some chest workouts but Mainly I want to focus on my shoulders and my delts because I'm trying to get better at a handstand. I can do a handstand but I can't hold it for very long and I think I have the strength but I want to improve my mobility in my shoulders just so I can kind of hold it at the very top because I do like these shoulder presses against my door here and I can like if I put my feet off the top of the door I feel like I can hold it but it's basically I'm trying to get like some more mobility in my wrist for example because without me pushing against my wrist I can only I only have like that and my wrist where you want to be like 90 degrees if you want to get to being able to do handstands more efficiently so like if you can kind of bend them back so I'll do a little bit of wrist mobility before I get into that
medium rare sirloin steak here and then some sauteed courgettes, mixed peppers and tomatoes as well. So one thing when you're cutting into the steak, if you want to cross section it numerous times so you can have it across your plate, you want to cut against the grain. If you're cutting against the grain then the juice can't escape from the steak. Excuse the lighting, I've just basically turned off all my blue lights and that just so I can start to wind down for bed. So basically I've just got one decaffeinated green tea bag here from these clipper tea bags. And then also with that, I'll let that soak for a little bit in the water. So once that's soaked and I take the tea bag out, I'll basically just put a shot of this apple cider vinegar in there as well. And when I have this like, um, I massively improves my gut bacteria whenever I have apple cider vinegar. I have this pretty much every day, every night now. And it's just kind of like a ritual I have before I go to bed and I find it just settles me down, knocks me out before I go to sleep. So I have this and with my extra gut biome capsules that I have earlier, I just find this really looks after my stomach. And as there's more research done on gut bacteria and looking after your intestines and whatnot, there's more and more health benefits to do so. So when I have these, I have decaffeinated tea, obviously, just so I'm not getting any caffeine, just so I can sleep. Because caffeine stays in your system from anything from like 7 to 14 hours. So I have my last caffeinated drink, like I pretty much just have one black coffee a day. Ryan Little.